So we talk so much about estrogen all the time, all the time. You've heard good, you've heard bad, you've heard ugly. You've heard me talk about it in relationship to the thyroid. I wanted to bring on an expert today who wrote a freaking amazing book. And I love the title. Estrogen <laughs> is a bitch because sometimes it can be. And Kate and I are going to get into this in depth today. And we're going to differentiate the good estrogen, the bad estrogen, why you don't want too much of it. Well, let me tell you about my guest first, and then we'll deep dive into this conversation. So Kate Vasquez, a, just a, a dear friend of mine. She's part of a, a big group that I'm in, all with like-minded health professionals. I love her to death. She's a functional medicine physician assistant, founder of Radiant Health and author of the book I just showed you. She loves empowering women to reclaim their health and vitality alongside her husband. She created an online course, The Estrogen Reset, and wrote a bestseller, Estrogen is a Bitch, to bring awareness about estrogen dominance. In her practice, Kate teaches women how to naturally balance their hormones as well as use their cycle as their superpower, reconnect them to themselves within and tap into their feminine energy at their highest level so they can create a life by design that they love living. So Kate, thank you so much for coming on and deep diving into this crazy topic that so many people talk about, estrogen. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for having me today, Amy. I'm just so honored and blessed to be here and to have this conversation with you today. Thank you. Well, I want to start off by, because I know we all have a story that led us into the area that we focus mm -hmm. on. So what brought you into diving into estrogen, estrogen dominance, learning all about it, treating women? Tell us your story. Yeah, absolutely. It's so crazy because like, I started off in Western medicine, as I'm sure you did, working at an urgent care. And um, I realized after a period of time, I wasn't really helping people. And I was seeing the same people over and over again for a lot of the same issues. And they would always tell me, why am I getting sick all the time? Where are these medications aren't helping? And I didn't have an answer for them to at the time. And I, it was actually kind of frustrating because I'm like, I got into medicine to help people. And a lot of people, I could help them, give them the quick fix and get them on their way. But there was a lot of people I couldn't help. And it was frustrating. But one day I came across Dr. Hyman, who talked about functional medicine, how it was the medicine of why. And I got so excited. It was like a light bulb moment. And I knew this is where I was meant to be. Um, and so I dove into learning about functional medicine, got my certification in Institute for Functional Medicine, but I also had my own health issues at the time, which right. I didn't think were a big deal. Like I've always had like high pain tolerance, just push through, you know, and I didn't realize like looking back, I had chronic neck pain, but I was like, eh, whatever it's tension, which it was, it was a lot of tension in my neck from right. stress. I had a lot of anxiety migraine since I was a child, developed acne and puberty, got them put on birth control pills, uh, the anxiety yeah. from like middle school all into my adult uh, life. And then I also started having GI issues. So constipation and bloating when I was in college. So looking back, it was just like a domino effect, one thing happening after the other. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, Western medicine, I didn't really go to the doctors except for the anxiety and the migraines, but a lot of times it's like they just look at each thing happening separately. But with functional medicine, I learned like everything was happening all together. Uh, all the systems are affecting each other. So I really dove in and learned how to heal my body. But at the time I was still on birth control pills. So it wasn't until about three years ago, I finally was able to come off, convince my husband to come off birth control because we weren't ready to have kids yet, right. but we both understood and knew about the long-term impacts that birth control was going to have on my body. So I was able to come off the birth control and I was surprised what happened. My hormones went crazy. And I was like, I didn't know what was going on in my body because I had done a lot of work healing my gut. So no more constipation and bloating really learn how to adapt to stress. So I didn't have the anxiety that I once had, but all of a sudden I was having irregular cycles and I never mm -hmm. had this before breast tenderness, severe menstrual cramps, and I even gained a little bit of weight. And I was like, Whoa, what is going on with my body? I and thought no I did the work. You expect it. No one told you like, oh, really? Hey, guess what? When you go on birth control, it's going to be a roller coaster. Yeah. Exactly. And even though I like did the work too to heal my body, I read Jolene Brighton's book, like Beyond the Pill, to like prepare my body to come off, my hormones still went crazy. But mm -hmm. now looking back, I realized when I came off of birth control, even though I learned how to 
adapt to stress and I adopted different techniques to calm my body down. I was still in a toxic environment. I was working at an urgent care while also uh, working the business, the practice radiant health. I was kind of doing both at the same time. And it was a very toxic, negative environment. And I loved my coworkers, but I could see that with the, with the business or the urgent care I was in, it was, it became very corporate. They weren't, they didn't feel like they were heard and it was impacting them and it was starting to impact me. And I was just so grateful that I found functional medicine and was working my way to get out of the urgent care. But I realized, wow, it was a very toxic environment. Plus, that probably had an effect on my cells and my hormones. So coming off the birth control, yeah, they went crazy. So I finally tested my hormones for the first time and I discovered I really needed to support estrogen metabolism because my body, my liver wasn't metabolizing estrogen properly. It was getting recirculated. And then my progesterone levels were so low from being suppressed for so, so long. Yep. Yeah. Yep. I'm glad and you mentioned so that. Yep. Oh my gosh. It was, it was an eye-opening experience for sure because yeah, no one told me about what's going to happen coming off. And I also knew that, I mean, we still haven't had kids yet three years later and we're, we're waiting for that time. But I knew that when it came time, I want to make sure my body was ready. My hormones were in the right place. The nutrients, um, you know, I wasn't deficient in anything because I've seen a lot of family and coworkers, friends, when they come off birth control, they would have a miscarriage. Like right after they, they would come off, get pregnant. And I was like, whoa, what is going on? I didn't want that to happen to me. Right. So, so yeah, so I <laughs> figured out what was going on, discovered there was an imbalance. I needed to support estrogen, support my progesterone levels. Oh, and my testosterone too was like, like nothing. <laughs> so I had to really support all my hormones, get those hormones back up. And also too, yeah, I was losing a lot of hair because my testosterone levels were so low. My libido yep. was low and all those were the after effects of birth control. So learning that, discovering that in myself, I started seeing the same patterns and same things happening in the clients I was seeing. And so I dove into learning more about estrogen dominance and this imbalance and the different ways to really help support the hormones. And it was a game changer, not only for me, but for my clients as well. I, I love so much of what you said right there. I, I don't even want to leave that topic yet. Number one, I love that you said about the low testosterone causing hair loss because I don't, I, I think that that's a, an overlooked factor when we're talking yeah. about hormones. I'm happy that you said your progesterone tag. I'm not happy that your progesterone tag, <laughs> but I'm happy you said it. I can't tell you. I'm sure you see it too. Yes. The amount of women, 20s, 30s, 40s, with progesterone levels that of a postmenopausal woman, it, they're oh, yeah. gone. There's right. no progesterone left at all. Mm -hmm. Coming back to the birth control, you know, sometimes people get sick of hearing it from me. Even my patients are like, yeah, 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 blah, 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 synthetic birth control. Can you please exp explain how detrimental synthetic birth control is to the body? Oh yeah. I mean, the first thing it is what's called a xenoestrogen and a xenoestrogen is a a foreign chemical, and this is a foreign estrogen. It's not the same estrogen our body produces. And so our body doesn't uh, metabolize this very, very well, especially through our liver. So anything that we are exposed to outside is going to add to the hormones. And we get it from sometimes in meat, conventional meat that is pumped full of hormones. So we're getting it from there. We're getting it from our birth control. Um, these xenoestrogens are impacting our body and they're also attaching to the same estrogen receptors. And so our body thinks there's really more estrogen than there really is because actually estrogen gets suppressed, but then we're getting in these extra, <laughs> you know, synthetic estrogens. And then what was crazy is like looking back at my, my timeline, my story, my, my, all the issues I was having, I had gut issues, you know, starting in college, but I was already like four or five years in on taking the birth control. Mm -hmm. And yes, it's not the only factor, but it is one of the contributing factors impacting gut health. And if you look at the studies and the research, it shows that birth control is linked to leaky gut and leaky gut is when that intestinal barrier gets disrupted because it's supposed to be very, very tight. It's one cell thick. It doesn't allow a lot of things to pass through, but things like birth control and Advil, which I took for, you know, I took a bunch of Advil for migraines. So that on top of and, and sprains from, you know, playing sports and injuries, Yep. Um, that stress, the amount of stress I was under because I, no one taught me how to, to help my body to calm down. Instead, you know, I was put on Prozac in PA school. And of course 
PA schools like medical boot camp. That's what I call it. Um, yeah. going 27 months straight through constant tests, um, like three a week. It was a stressful time in my life. And yeah you know, just everything compounding on each other really impacted my gut health. But yeah, I think, and also, I mean, inflammatory foods too. So we can't forget that there's so many different factors, but yes, birth control is one of those factors that doesn't get looked at and addressed that impacts the gut health. And plus studies also show there's a link between the development of ulcerative colitis and Crohn's with birth control. So women, if you are on birth control and all of a sudden you have ulcerative colitis and Crohn's, that might be one of the reasons why, in addition to everything else I mentioned. So mm -hmm. that's one of the long-term uh, impacts of being on birth control. And not only that, but birth control also decreases our liver's ability to produce something called bilirubin. And bilirubin is needed to make something called bile. And when the liver produces bile, it gets stored in our gallbladder. And there's actually a link to a lot of women developing gallbladder issues uh, when they're on birth control. In fact, I had, I remember having a client come to me on birth control with gallbladder stones. And she asked her doctor, like, you know, could the birth control have caused this? No, no, no. Oh, I'm like, uh, <laughs> right. Did she not yeah. look at the research and the studies? <laughs> Cause yeah, it impacts the production of bile. And why is this so important? Well, because in our uh, when, when estrogen gets metabolized, it gets metabolized in our liver first. So there's two phases, phase one and phase two, it goes from active to an inactive form. Once it goes through phase two, and then in phase two, after it goes into inactive form, it binds to bile. And when it binds to bile, it then goes to our intestines, which is phase three elimination of estrogen. Now, a lot of women tend to have issues in one, two, or all three phases, which is not good because we are supposed to make estrogen and use it, but then also get rid of it. Rid of the it. problem yep. is, is like when those phases are impacted, we end up reusing estrogen over and over again and not eliminating it. So this is why it's important that our body should be producing bile so we can bind those inactive estrogens so we can get rid of it in our intestines. But birth control impacts that ability. So when I discovered this, I was like, oh my goodness. And then women that are on birth control that already have gallbladder or develop gallbladder disease. And it's funny because gallstones were not seen as gallbladder disease, but it's like, yes, anything that impacts the normal function of the gallbladder is right. dis-ease. <laughs> so, and then they take your gallbladder out. And then they take your gallbladder, which we need. And a lot of women have issues, you know, digesting fats afterwards. Yep. So it's like, the, yes, it stores, but it still is important uh, for digestion of food. And that was the biggest um, factor. And also not only the estrogen impacting the, um, the gallbladder production or excuse me, the bilirubin production, it, the progestin, which is the synthetic progesterone also slows down the motility, meaning mm -hmm. the ability for the gallbladder to contract when it's supposed to. <laughs> so yep. that's what creates that sludge when the gallbladder is not contracting things slow down. And then it's, uh, that bile forms with cholesterol and then forms the stones. So, so it's just so crazy and mind blowing, but unfortunately, you know, we're not trained. You and I both weren't trained, you know, the, about the long-term effects of birth control. It wasn't until I was pouring through the studies, like what, what were the long-term effects and what is it doing to our bodies? And then another thing that I discovered too, going back to like, why did I have low testosterone is because it increases a protein called sex hormone binding globulin. Oh yeah. 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 <laughs> and it was like, <laughs> we'll talk on that. Yeah. That's a, that's a mean, mean hormone. It's just, yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, what is this thing? You know, this protein. That's well, protein. it loves yeah. to, yeah. yeah, it loves to bind up our sex hormones and it loves testosterone over all the other tests, uh, uh, sex hormones. Yep. And so when I like looked at my Hormone that tested my sex hormone binding globulin, and sure enough, it was high. And Dr. Jolene Brighton even talks about this in her book. Like some women, after being on birth control, because I was on it over 15 years, sometimes they have high levels and it doesn't come back down. Luckily, mine was able to come back down because when sex hormone binding is low, it actually releases that testosterone and we have more testosterone available in the body. But when it binds all that testosterone, that's when women will experience the low libido and the hair loss. So those were the main things that I discovered and like the long-term impacts that birth control had. And I was like mind blown when I discovered that. So. <laughs> oh yeah. And listen, we get it. If, if women don't want to get pregnant, I don't want to have a child either. Like never have, don't want to right now. So I get it that you're using birth control as birth control, but there's so many other methods yeah. that can be used as opposed to putting 
synthetic hormones in your body. That I'm going to add one more to the birth control um, effects. It tanks your thyroid. We also know birth control tanks your thyroid function. Yeah. So now you have, again, it's that that whole triple, double, quadruple whammy. Low thyroid function, no testosterone, estrogen dominance, and no progesterone. Right. You're going to be fat, bald, holding water, <laughs> and moody, and you're probably not going to sleep. Like right. that's this that's the the gift that birth control gives to you, but you won't get pregnant. Let's right. think of another way, <laughs> right? Let's just let's go down another path. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I use a, not, the fertility awareness method, which, you know, if you follow it to a T, it works. And I've been doing the last three years and still have not gotten pregnant. So there are definitely different ways, alternatives to not get pregnant. And it's, it's so interesting to me, you know, if you think about, and actually I got, I didn't get on it to, to avoid pregnancy. I initially got on it for birth or not for, uh, for acne, you know, so mm-hmm. a lot of women may not necessarily be getting on it just to avoid pregnancy, but to control hormonal uh, symptoms of hormonal imbalance when instead we need to look at the root of what's going on. Why is this happening in the first place? Mm-hmm. And which I realized like the acne was probably from eating the conventional meat full of antibiotics and hormones and milk. And then, you know, all the stress and all the, everything that was impacting my gut and then the estrogen dominance that I developed. So it was just like all these different things, you know, leading up. I never, you know, I don't think I had high testosterone. I never had signs of PCOS, but right. Um, but yeah, all these things I'm like, oh, wow, that's what's because once I healed my gut, balanced my hormones, my skin has never been the clearest. Oh, it's gorgeous. <laughs> it, you guys can't see her if you're listening on the podcast. She's beautiful and her skin is perfect. So, <laughs> <laughs> and, and you know, birth control was just another band aid again, like it you is. said, instead of getting to the root cause of why you had the acne. And then, if, if, if you are a PCOS patient, guarantee you were given birth control as a slap on band aid. And it's just, you have to get to the root cause because the body is just a beautiful thing. It's just, it's so interconnected. So Kate, can you tell us what, what are the signs of estrogen dominance? Don't they kind of cross over a little bit with low estrogen or am I confusing that? Can you, can you tell us what are the they signs can. people can look for? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. They can, because what happens well, actually, no, not with low estrogen, but when women go through pen- menopause, because Menop- more yeah. s- signs of low estrogen is more like you know, they have vaginal dryness because we need estrogen to keep our skin plump, Mm -hmm. you know, pain with intercourse, more uh, frequent UTIs, uh, yeast infections. Um, Actually, you can get yeast infections with excess estrogen too, but also um, the hot flashes, the night sweats. Um, So those are more like symptoms of low estrogen, but with high estrogen or when women start to go through menopause, they can get a little estrogen dominance too, Mm -hmm. because progesterone is the first hormone to decline. So that will create that estrogen dominance effect. So a lot of those symptoms um, is irregular periods as I was, you know, talking about what happened to me. So instead of having like a regular, you know, 26 day, 30 day, 28 day cycle, um, the cycles are just like all over the place. Like it could be 30 day one day, it could be 36 days, it could be, you know, 42 days. So it's just like every month is very irregular. Like a regular cycle should be anywhere from like 24 to 32 days. And it can vary like one or two days a month, but that's about it. It shouldn't be like more than like seven days between each period. So that's an irregular cycle. So if you're experiencing that, that's definitely a sign of estrogen dominance. Mm -hmm. And the next sign is heavy periods because that's not normal too, because what happens is when there's a lot of estrogen in the system and there's not enough progesterone to balance that out, the estrogen will really thicken what's called the endometrial lining, which is inside the uterus. And when we have progesterone, progesterone should be increasing and peaking during the second half of our menstrual phase, which is the luteal phase. Mm -hmm. And so if that doesn't happen, we have that really thick endometrial lining. So when we finally do have our periods really thick and heavy, and sometimes women will experience clots. So normally women should change tampons like six, six or seven or six to eight tampons a day, but they shouldn't be completely soaked through. Like maybe the first day or two might be a little bit heavier, but if you're having like three, four or five days and it's really, really heavy soaking through all your tampons and pads, like more than like eight per day, that's not normal. (laughs) And Mm -hmm. if you're seeing pots too. So that is definitely not normal sign of uh, estrogen dominance. The third sign is PMS symptoms. 
And that's because if there's a lot of estrogen in the system, it actually causes an increase in prostaglandins. Now we normally have a release of prostaglandins, which are these chemicals. It creates a little inflammation in the body, but it also helps our uterus to contract so we can actually have our period. We want to release that endometrial lining so it can, we can shed that and have our period. But when there's a lot of estrogen in our system, it increases more of those prostaglandins, which is why women will have those really severe, painful menstrual cramps. And then not only that, if you also have low estrogen, that's going to cause the mood swings and the headaches. So yeah, all of that, uh, all the fun stuff, yeah. all, all the fun stuff. And that happens a week before your period. So, so those are the, the PMS symptoms. Then the fourth one is breast tenderness, which a lot of people will lump into PMS symptoms, but I also like to separate out because extra, extra estrogen, will cause that breast tissue to swell, fills up with fluid. Sometimes estrogen can also cause cysts to form. So a lot of women with like fibrocystic breast disease, it's usually because of the estrogen. They're not metabolizing it properly. There's a lot in their system. And that's what happened to me. I just was having those, those tender breasts. Like it hurt to put a bra on. I'm like, I couldn't even like sleep on my side. I was just like, Oh, I didn't want, want to be touched. Nothing. Yep. It's just like yep. so, so tender. Um, yeah, that's not normal. If you're experiencing tenderness breast, that is not normal. And then the fifth symptom was weight gain and primarily in the butt, hips, and thighs. And that's because mm -hmm. estrogen is responsible for the development of our curves and our butt, hips, and thighs. But when yep. women are starting to gain excess weight um, and it's primarily going in that area, that's definitely a sign of estrogen dominance as well. Right. So, right. so yeah, those are like the five, like I call them the five telltale symptoms of estrogen dominance. So if women have like two or three of those symptoms, it's definitely a, a high likelihood that you have estrogen dominance, but other symptoms can include like fatigue and brain fog, um, low libido. I talked about acne, um, mm -hmm. even infertility are some of the symptoms as well. Yeah. And so kind of circling back again with estrogen dominance, do you I know a lot of women are, are listening right now and they're going, but my estrogen wasn't flagged high mm -hmm. and it's not about that. Now I use really a one to 20 ratio with progesterone. So if your estrogen is coming in, I don't, I'll just pick a number. E estrogen's 200. And based on the phase of your cycle, yeah, it's in the normal range. But then when we look at progesterone, again, like I said earlier, progesterone is that of a postmenopausal woman and you're not supposed to be, then you are estrogen dominant. Is that how you look at estrogen dominance too? Or do you just look for that H that, that flagged high? No. So if, if I'm looking at blood work, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I will look to see, cause there's not really a range like estrogen should be, but if, right. if women are a hundred, 150, then that's okay. But yeah, if I see like 200, 300, that's a lot of estrogen. And then yeah. I look at progesterone too, because then progesterone should normally be between 15 to 25. Mm -hmm. And so women are like 10 and their estrogen's 200. That's like a, an amount. That's still, yeah. It comes <laughs> into the one to 20 ratio, but you're stretching it. You're at the upper limit. Yeah, exactly. Yes, exactly. You are at the upper limit. Um, yeah. But also we'll look at urine testing too. And they actually have different, um, different lab ranges as well as far as the urine testing. Right. But I also too, just to make sure like it's not towards the upper end of the range, the estrogen and the progesterone is not towards the lower end of the range. Cause that too will also, if I'm seeing that, and actually, you know, there are three different types of patterns that I'll typically see in women that can create that estrogen dominance. So the patterns that I'm, I'm looking at is making sure that, you know, uh, progesterone is normal and optimal. And then estrogen is not too low and not too high. But what are the, the three different patterns I'll typically see is normal progesterone and really, really high estrogen, or I'll see low progesterone and normal estrogen, or the third one is normal progesterone and really high estrogen. So those are the three different things that I look at. It's like, you know, making sure that those two are, are balanced. Yeah. And looking at that pattern and then pairing it up to the person's symptoms. So yes. if they're checking all of your boxes for symptoms of estrogen dominance, chances are they have estrogen dominance. I mean, it crosses over with some other things too, but when you're looking at the labs and pairing it up with the symptoms, I think that's the perfect way oh, to yeah. figure it all out. Absolutely. So on here, we talk a ton, obviously about thyroid and how high estrogen is one of the causes of elevated reverse T3 and it impairs the thyroid, but I want them to hear it from you. What do you find in your practice with estrogen and its re estrogen dominance and its relationship to the thyroid? 
Yeah, absolutely. And it's so crazy because it's like a lot of I've had clients come to me with thyroid issues and no one really ever looks at their hormones. And I'm like, why not? Crazy. <laughs> it drives me batshit. It really does. <laughs> Like, how is your doctor just testing your thyroid and not your hormones? But yeah, go ahead. Yeah. And that's because when there's a lot of excess estrogen in the body, it's not being metabolized out. It actually increases a protein that binds up thyroid hormones. It's called thyroid binding globulin or TBG. And so when that happens, it binds up a lot of the T3 or T4. I mean, it mostly binds up T4, but that's a problem too, because if it binds up T4, it's not converting to T3, but it can also bind up a little T3. So that is what can create that hypothyroidism in a lot of women. So that is like the biggest factor too, but also it excess estrogen increases inflammation in the body. And so when we have increased inflammation, we're getting more reverse T3, which is the inactive form of, of T3. And then it's also increasing the antibodies, the thyroid peroxidase or TPO antibodies. And then it's going to lead into, um, uh, into autoimmune disorders like Hashimoto's. So, so that's what I've commonly seen in women with, uh, estrogen dominance and thyroid issues. It's like, okay, if I see the high TPO or high reverse T, T3, let's look at estrogen and see where it's at because, you know, it's like, it's multifactorial. It's not just looking at one thing or two things. It's looking at everything. As I mentioned before, like functional medicine is looking at all the systems and, you know, and that's one of the things like women will come to me, they're like, okay, I eliminated gluten and dairy. You know, I did this, I did that, but I still am having the symptoms. Okay. Well, let's look at your hormones and let's balance that. And that usually is what really, really helps um, improve their symptoms. Cause if we can lower that um, inflammation in the body, lower the estrogen, the antibodies are going to come down. We're going to release more of those, those thyroid hormones and they're going to be happier overall. <laughs> yeah. Yes. And, and it, with my community, you know, we focus so much on thyroid. I think it's very easy yeah. for even some of my patients to go, well, I need more thyroid hormone because I don't feel any good. Well, okay, let's look at your hormones. And sometimes testosterone will be in the tank. Estrogen right. will be high. Progesterone will be in the tank. And I go, well, your thyroid looks great, but all this over here, the hormone panel, right. no, not so much. So we fix these, then your optimized thyroid will give you a bang for its buck. It will give you um, an applause for being optimized because you won't have the messed up hormones over here creating the same symptoms exactly. and masking. And everybody thinks, well, it must be my thyroid. Well, no, hormones too. Let's, let's remember the hormones, doctors right. and patients. Let's remember the hormones. Yeah, exactly. Especially like the fatigue, the brain fog, the weight gain. A lot of people think thyroid, but it's the hormones too. And the hair loss. Yeah. I can't forget the hair loss. <laughs> and the hair loss, which plagues so many women. Yeah. So then where do I want to go next? There's so many things going through my mind that I want to talk to you about. What's the main cause? What, what throws estrogen off to get it in balance? I mean, we talked about the xenoestrogens. That's kind of the external, but what else are you seeing? Yeah. Oh man. There's so much to talk about the xenoestrogens too, but, but yeah, I mean the, the biggest, <laughs> yeah, there's, there's so many different things. I mean, the first thing that I always like to look at is the gut health. I mean, even Hippocrates, a physician thousands of years ago, once said all disease begins in the gut. And it's so crazy to think about, like he said that thousands of years ago, he was onto something. Yet we in our Western world have really forgotten to look at the gut, but thank goodness for functional medicine, because we actually look into the gut. Right. And uh, that was the first thing I worked on myself. And why is the gut so important? Well, because in the gut, I'm sure everyone's heard of the microbiome, or if you haven't yet, is all these trillions of microorganisms in the gut, a lot of bacteria, and sometimes, yes, even yeast and parasites and things, but they should be living in community. Like one should not be taking over. Um, so think of like an Indian tribe, like everybody should be living um, in community. And if one decides to come in and attack and take over, that is what creates dysbiosis. And uh, in the reason why this is important because we actually have gut bacteria called the estrobilum. Like their role is to help estrogen metab or get estrogen metabolized in the gut. And so when a, a certain bacteria or parasite or yeast starts to take over and creates this dysbiosis, it actually really hurts that estrobilum. And so estrogen is not able to be metabolized properly out of the gut. And we also have this enzyme called beta glucuronidase, which 
it's supposed to low. It's supposed to like hang out and just kind of like go undercover and, and not really do anything. But when we get this dysbiosis, now all of a sudden it gets increased in our gut. And this is a problem because when estrogen, remember, goes through the liver, goes from in, uh, active to its inactive form, binds to bile, goes to the gut. Now all of a sudden this beta glucuronidase says, oh no, wait a second. Let me like make you active again. And then it gets recirculated back in the body because now the body's like, oh, you're not ready to get eliminated. Let's reuse you and, you know, get you back in. So that's a problem. And, and it's crazy looking at when I did the gut testing, I had that dysbiosis. I had a lot of bad bacteria. Actually, it was growing into my small intestines. Okay. So something called small intestinal bacterial yep. overgrowth, SIBO. So mm -hmm. I had SIBO because I had the bloating, the constipation, which are the, like those common symptoms associated with SIBO. Yep. So I had to really work on like removing inflammatory foods, healing my gut lining. Cause remember birth control really impacts the, the gut lining causes that leaky gut right. and put in the good bacteria back in. So, oh, and also support digestion, digestion of my food. Cause I wasn't digesting food properly. Mm -hmm. So there was just so many different things that I had to do to really optimize my gut health. And I had those elevated beta glucuronidase levels. And so the way to get those levels back down is to get that good bacteria back in and get rid of those bad guys, bad gut, bite, gut mm -hmm. bad gut bugs. <laughs> so yeah, five times fast. I yeah. know, right? <laughs> um, so, so yeah, so gut health is so, so important because it really plays a huge role in estrogen, estrogen metabolism. It's phase three. So, so that's the first thing I look at. And there's so many things that can impact that, which I've already like covered, you know, the medications, the stress, the toxins, even heavy metals, which I actually ended up, I was eating a lot of tuna at the time. And they say, you know, once a week is okay, but yeah, once a week, it does add up. Yeah. <laughs> Plus there's, there's so many, uh, we get exposed to mercury in our environment and oh. there's so many different sources, but yeah, I had high levels of mercury. So I had to like detox my body to get rid of that. Um, so gut health is really, really important. Mm -hmm. And then stress, I mentioned that because remember, I was in a very toxic environment at the yep. urgent care I was working on, uh, working at also the mindset. So like, you know, when it comes to stress, there's different types of stress. There's physical stress, which is like if we get an injury um, or we go through surgery, you know, something physical that happens to the body. There's also chemical stress when we're exposed to toxins and chemicals, radiation, and then there's mental, emotional stress. And I've had a lot of people tell me like, well, I'm not stressed because everything's good in their personal life and their, their work yeah. life. But I'm like, okay, but what's going on in here? Right. <laughs> the yes. mental stress, because Yes, we may feel calm, but we talk negatively to ourselves. Like mm -hmm. I'm guilty of that. We have 70,000 thoughts per day and 80% of those thoughts are negative. And when I heard that statistic, I was like, oh my gosh. But then I realized I was like, oh, wow, I do say a lot of bad things about, you know, to myself yeah. and, yep. you know, cause I hold myself to high standards. So if something doesn't happen and, you know, I, I tend to beat myself up, but that's not mm -hmm. good. That's not no. good. Cause our cells are listening. They are responding to our thoughts. And there's a lot of books out there that talk about this. So, yep. um, so yeah, stress was a big thing and, you know, being in a toxic negative environment, listening to negativity of the coworkers around me was impacting my body at a cellular level. And also, you know, I learned that I needed to also help calm my body down because my body was constantly in a sympathetic state because we have two different types of, uh, of systems. We have the parasympathetic and the sympathetic nervous system. Mm -hmm. And our bodies are not meant to be in a sympathetic, which is that fight or flight state like 24 seven. But unfortunately in our modern day society, that's what happens. We get into this sympathetic state, drives up cortisol, drives mm -hmm. up glucose, increases inflammation in our body. And then of course it lowers our progesterone and then it creates this estrogen dominance. So, uh, and then it impacts the thyroid. So, yeah. so yeah, I, uh, <laughs> that was like the biggest thing is just like learning to help my body to calm down, doing yoga, meditation, deep breathing. So I started doing these things and then also a lot of mindset work because I'm also mm. type A perfectionist. Yeah. yeah, I get that. Yeah. <laughs> and I really had to learn how to like let things go, stop taking things personally and realizing like life is happening for me. It's not happening to me. Right. And that was such a huge shift for me. And so, yeah, I challenge everyone like, you know, 
if you're in a toxic environment with like relationships and, you know, uh, definitely like get out of that. Cause that's impacting yeah. your body, looking at your mindset, um, tuning into the thoughts about yourself. Cause that's also impacting your body at a cellular level. Um, but also we want to get our bodies out of that chronic sympathetic fate. And that's another thing, like, uh, things that are, we're constantly, you know, met with like so many demands and, you know, have to get this done and do this and constantly go, 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 go throughout the day. Mm -hmm. And another thing that was happening too, like I was go, go, go from the time I went up, woke up to the time I went to bed and I wasn't calming my body down either. So what was a game changer for me was a bedtime routine, just like winding down an hour before bed. And yeah. that just like really helped to calm my body, calm inflammation as well. So yeah, so stress is a huge, huge factor. And then the toxins. So I want to come back into the toxins because mm -hmm. when I learned about <laughs> functional medicine and discovering all the toxins that were present, I was like, just mind blown. In fact, I looked at a study the environmental working group had done and it said women use 12 products on average per day and are exposed to 168 chemicals. And I was like, what? That's before just, they leave the house. That's like, before that's... they leave the house. Yeah, exactly. Before you get in contact with the exhaust and the pollution and who knows right. what else outside. <laughs> so, so yeah, I was just like, oh my goodness. When I saw this, it's just, it's just, statistic, I ran to my bathroom and just like looking at all the products I was using and counting all the ingredients. I'm like, oh my goodness, I'm using mo more than a hundred ingredients, putting them on my body and the products like Neutrogena and Maybelline and Lysol and Clora, like all these products that are heavily marketed, they're destroying our hormones. They're called endocrine disruptors because of those xenoestrogens and uh, even the makeup. Yeah. The makeup I was using, the shampoo, like, and I realized it's like, oh my gosh, I have a toxic home and I needed mm -hmm. to get rid of everything. But then it was very overwhelming because I'm like, I'm going to have to get rid of everything, but yeah. it's way too expensive, you know, to get rid of everything in the home. So I started replacing one thing at a time. Exactly. Um, and over time we finally have better products in our home, uh, but not just the products we're using on our body, but you know, all in the household cleaning products, but the stuff in our kitchen, you know, okay. like I was using plastic spoons to cook my food and the nonstick cookware and the plastic warming my food in plastic containers and drinking out yep. water bottles. And, you know, all these things, as you know, contain the BPA, the bisphenol mm -hmm. A. So it impacts not only thyroid, but it yep. also contributes to the estrogen dominance as well. So yeah, um, the toxins in the environment is, is huge. Um, also, I mean, we talked about birth control. That's another, mm -hmm. um, cause of, of estrogen dominance, also histamines too. And this was something too, that I ended up discovering, um, on my journey is that a lot of my clients were getting better, but there was a handful that just weren't getting better, even though I was working on the gut and balancing their hormones and helping them to adapt to stress. Mm -hmm. They just still weren't getting better. But then I realized a lot of them were very sensitive. They were sensitive to a lot of things in their environment, the products that they were using, um, allergies. And I was yep. like, oh, or having rashes. And I'm like, hmm, I learned about histamine. So I started looking into it and testing them. Mm -hmm. A lot of them, the histamine would come back really high. Now, there's a few that didn't come back high. So, yes, it's a helpful test, but doesn't necessarily rule it out. Yep. Definitely, if you are sensitive to everything, um, look into histamines. Because once I pulled out histamine foods and gave them some natural antihistamine supplements, it was like 360, like, change. It was a game changer for right. them. They went from, like, having painful ovulation, really painful periods, um, the mood swings, the anxiety, the irritability to like having like, you know, painless periods. They didn't have the pain around ovulation anymore and they mm -hmm. were calmer. You know, they were able to handle things a lot better in their, in their life. And it was just so crazy how like something so simple <laughs> really made a huge difference because uh, histamines and estrogen actually re attach to the same receptor, which is H1. And we have histamine receptors in our reproductive organs. So if we understand that, it's like there's a lot of histamines in our body. Um, estrogen also increases histamine and then histamine also causes more estrogen to be produced as well. So it ends up becoming yep. this vicious cycle. So that was a missing link that I discovered in a lot of my clients, which also contributed to estrogen dominance. So basically there's a whole lot of things out there that are contributing to estrogen dominance. Yes. yes. And there's, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. I was, and because there's so many, I realized like estrogen dominance is so, this is why it's so common and why like 80 to 90% of the women that I saw had it. 
So what can people do about it? That's the, that's the big question on everybody's mind. I know they're asking about DIM. They're asking about different yeah. supplements. So what can be done yeah. about estrogen dominance? Yeah, absolutely. So the first thing is to, you know, if you have the opportunity, um, work with someone to look at your gut health. But if not, what you want to do is figure out what are the foods that you're sensitive to that's affecting your gut, but also pulling out inflammatory processed foods, anything that's packaged, a lot of, you know, processed sugar, anything that has processed sugar, I'd start with removing like gluten and dairy, if you haven't already anything to really help support the gut health, and then taking probiotics, increasing fermented foods to really help uh, promote that healthy gut bacteria. However, I always say be careful, because if you have an overgrowth of bacteria, like I had in the gut, um, or a histamine issue. If you take probiotics and eat fermented foods, that actually can make you feel worse. So that's another sign that there's issues in the gut. So yes, those things are good, but um, sometimes it's best to just get the gut checked, work on healing the gut. Um, Cause yeah, now that I got rid of that, I can eat, you know, fermented foods and take probiotics and I'm perfectly fine. But, uh, but yeah, it's really focusing on the gut health mm -hmm. and two is also uh, getting rid of, of all the toxics in your home, you know? So you really want to reduce the toxic burden as much as possible. And I get it. Like when I learned about the toxins, I'm like, I'm, I think it would just be best to live in a bubble or like go live on an Island and make everything from homemade, you know, that's homemade in scratch. But I realized, okay, that's not realistic. Yeah. So start swapping things out one at a time. And I recommend a couple apps. Um, Environmental Working Group is great. You can search the Skin Deep database online. They also have an app, um, Healthy Living. But also two apps that I love is Think Dirty and Yuka, Y-U-K-A, because it has a little scanner in it. Yeah, and you can scan all the products in your home. So it'll give you a rating if it's clean or dirty. And then you can go to the store and scan all the products in the store to find a better alternative. So I recommend just start swapping things out one at a time. Like start with your toothpaste, start with your shampoo, mm -hmm. you know, your soap. And then eventually you can go to like your detergent and all the household cleaning products. Um, so start swapping things out one at a time. And those apps are super, super helpful. And then creating a self-care routine because that was so, so important for me. So instead of waking up and like, go, 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 I have a little self-care routine that I do in the morning. That's like yoga and meditation and deep breathing. And then I have an hour before I go to bed where I start winding down, whether it's like taking an Epsom salt bath, you know, I did the lights, read a book, drink some chamomile tea. So I do things to calm my body in the morning. And when I don't do that, I feel way more on edge and more anxious and stressed through the day. But when I do my self-care routine, I can show up in a much calmer and confident state. So self-care is going to be huge. And then you don't even have to do it for long. You know, even if it's like 10, 15 minutes makes a huge difference than not doing it at all. So I definitely recommend doing a self-care routine. Also um, really focusing on the nutrients too. So we need specific nutrients uh, for in certain foods, like cruciferous vegetables, for example, are really good to really help support estrogen metabolism and mm -hmm. helps um, phase one and phase two of estrogen metabolism. Mm -hmm. And also leafy greens contain a lot of B vitamins to help phase two of estrogen metabolism, um, red, orange foods. So, so fruits and vegetables like peppers and strawberries are really good to help with, um, with progesterone production because it contains vitamin C also green, green, like broccoli, leafy greens also contain a lot of vitamin C as well. So you want to yeah. load up on foods, high in vitamin C, B vitamins, B6 is also important for progesterone production. I also love seed cycling. That is like one of my favorite ways because food is medicine and it really helps to get my cycles regular again after I came off of birth control and the seeds they're so simple, but are just packed with healthy fats and so many vitamins and minerals to support estrogen metabolism and production in uh, the first half of the menstrual phase. And then uh, progesterone production and continue with estrogen metabolism in the second half of the phase. And so the first phase, uh, first two weeks, I always recommend grinding up flax and pumpkin seeds. And then the second, uh, two weeks. So basically every 14 weeks, you're alternating seeds. So the second, uh, 14 weeks you're, or 14 days, excuse me, 14 days, you're going to grind up sesame and sunflower seeds. So you're going to do that every two weeks. And that's really, really helpful to support your hormones. And, and then daily, every single day, use them, oh, that's on true. Yeah. whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. 
Absolutely. Yeah. Cause even if, if you're not cycling, you're going into menopause, you know, you may not be able to follow your, your menstrual cycle, but even if you consume those seeds, it's going to really help support your hormones as well. Um, but yeah, as far as the supplements, so yes, there's a lot of, if you Google, there's a lot of research and a lot of blogs saying, take DIM, take DIM for estrogen dominance, but you have to be careful because yes, DIM yeah. definitely helped me, but mm -hmm. That's because I looked at my, my estrogen metabolism, looking yeah. at phase one, phase two, because not everyone needs DIM. In fact, I've done tests and I look at some women have optimal phase one supports. So they actually don't need DIM or mm -hmm. they need support with phase one and phase two. So if you're not supporting phase two, what happens is those hormones get stuck in phase two and actually makes you feel worse. Okay. And I've had a lot of women come to me. They're like, yeah, I took DIM and I had headaches and really bad cramps. I'm like, Ooh, well, let's look at what's going on. Yeah. And that's because the other pathways two and three weren't supported. So yes, DIM is great. It's helpful, but don't take it without testing first and working with a practitioner who can provide you those recommendations because yeah, you can actually feel a lot worse and really affect your estrogen metabolism if you're not careful. But B vitamins are also really important for phase two. Broccoli sprouts also help mm -hmm. with phase two. You can eat them, but you can also take them in supplement form as well. Mm -hmm. um, as for as progesterone, you know, talk about vitamin C. So sometimes taking in extra vitamin C can really help progesterone production, B6. Um, so those are the common supplements that I, I usually recommend. But again, you know, see a practitioner, get testing to see if you really need these and which ones you need support with. Beautiful. Beautiful. Well, thank you, Kate. I want you to tell everyone, I mean, this has been a fantastic talk. We have a ton of people listening already. Awesome. And it, it just, I, I know it's going to land home with so many women, so yeah. many of my women listeners. So can you tell everyone, and we'll have this in the show notes, but can you tell everyone where they can find you? And I know you are giving our audience, amazing gift. It's a free PDF version of your book. Now I have to say it is on Audible. Now I actually read a book. I actually read a book. That's big for me because I have no time, but I was on a plane multiple times, Kate. So that's how I got your book in. But now it's on Audible too. So there's no excuse. If you don't have time, you can get on Audible. So can you tell people where they can find you? Yeah, absolutely. So everyone can find me on yourradianthealth.com. That's my website. Also, I'm on Instagram primarily. It's Kate Vasquez underscore PA. So you can definitely find me there if you have any questions. You know, definitely send me a DM. Uh, you can also find me on Facebook and LinkedIn. But like I said, I'm definitely more more on Instagram. And uh, as far as the book, yeah, it is on Amazon. I love, I personally love the physical book because I like to highlight and underline. Yeah, and that's yeah. what a lot of the women do. They, they make their notes, they highlight, they fold the pages. Yeah. Do whatever. Cause my goal was to like really provide it in a format that was easy to understand. That's digestible and give mm -hmm. you simple steps to take away um, at the end of the book. And there's so many resources too um, in the book, yeah. but also online as well. So you definitely want to take advantage of that. And yeah, it's in many forms. It's paperback, hardcover, uh, Kindle and audio version. Um, Cause a lot of women are on the go like yourself. Yeah. And I knew like the audio version was going to be helpful for those women as well. But yeah, uh, also I created a quiz, it's the estrogen dominance quiz. So if you're not sure if you have estrogen dominance or not, you definitely want to take the quiz and, um, and then we can go from there and just explore and you can get more information from the book as well. Oh my goodness. That's amazing. Well, Kate, thank you so much for your time today. This has been so helpful for everyone. I really appreciate it. And yeah, I wish you luck in your, in your book ventures. I'm sure there's going to be another one coming out eventually. Oh, yeah. No pressure, but down the road, another. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me today. And yeah, there is definitely going to be another book. I have a feeling it's going to be on mindset, but, but we'll see. We'll see oh, what happens. When yes. it comes up. <laughs> like All right, Kate, thank you so much once again. Yeah. Thank you so much.